Hey, welcome back to the Current Events Bulletin session. Our next speaker is Anup Rao, who got his PhD in 2015 from Dan Spielman of Yale. And uh, we're going from the continuous and the far out in space to sunflowers and, and discrete mathematical questions. A uh, very different part of the world of mathematics and a very attractive one. So Anup, please. Thanks. Let me try to share my screen. I, I will make a correction. I actually uh, I'm a lot older than that. I got my PhD huh. in 2007, I think. It was such a long time ago that I don't remember. Uh, I apologize. In the, in the math genealogy project, it says 2015. My oh, yeah, there, I'm experienced, I've experienced a strange situation where there's an, another person with exactly the same name who also got his PhD in a very similar area. And I, th I believe he graduated from Yale. <laughs> so we have a name clash. Um, all right, so uh, what I want to tell you about today uh, is uh, this beautiful line of work concerning sunflowers. Uh, and this has had an immense amount of applications in many um, seemingly unrelated areas. And I wanna give you a sense for some of that in my talk. Uh, so what is a sunflower? A sunflower is a very simple combinatorial object. It's a collection of sets uh, where every pair of sets has exactly the same intersection. So here's a picture. Uh, the, the sets on the left here are three sunflowers, three sets, uh, and every pair of sets has the same intersection. And on the right is uh, four sunflowers, four sets with the same pairwise intersections. And uh, the central question uh, that was first posed by Erosh and Rado is, uh, can you say, uh, is it true that uh, every large family of sets must contain a sunflower. Every large family of sets must contain a sunflower. And uh, this, is a, this is a really, uh, this is a, an example of a kind of question that's been very fruitful in combinatorics uh, in, in this field called Ramsey theory, where you ask, uh, where, where people have been able to show often that large systems often contain uh, structured, uh, St structures inside them. Uh, you know, one of the famous examples is Roth's theorem, which says that if you have a large, if you have a dense set of integers, then this set of integers must contain an arithmetic progression. Okay, that's an example of this phenomenon. You take an arbitrary dense collection of integers, there will be an, uh, an arithmetic progression. And that's the flavor of, of this question. If, if you think about it, you know, as I pose it here, you, you, you'll quickly see that there are large families of sets like this one, uh, which does not contain any sunflower. But what Erdos and Rado showed is that if you uh, take a large collection of sets that are all the same size, then you will find a sunflower. So in particular, if you take P minus one to the K times K factorial sets of size K, then there will be a sunflower with P petals meaning a sunflower with P sets, okay? And uh, uh, so that, that's a really beautiful proof. It has, a, it's, it's only a few lines long, uh, uh, but they, they wondered whether it's tight, okay? Because uh, the best examples you could come up with don't match this bond. So it's easy to see that there is a collection of sets, uh, P minus one to the K sets of size K uh, that does not have a sunflower. And the bound that they proved is that if you have more than P minus one to the K times K factorial sets, then you do have a P sunflower. And they, they conjectured that actually this kind of dependence in the parameters is the correct dependence. That actually for every uh, parameter P, there is some constant C that depends only in P such that C to the K sets of size K would, would apply uh, a P sunflower among, among those sets. That's the conjecture. And uh, <clears throat> this concept, although it's so simple, has had an amazing number of applications to many different areas, areas where at first you would, you would not guess they have anything to do with sunflowers. And I wanna give you a sense of that by giving you a few examples. And uh, recently in the last two or three years, there's been 
uh, after more than 40 or 50 years, a lot of progress on the conjecture. So this bound now of Erdős and Rado has been improved finally. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the improvement as well as applications of, of, of this, these kinds of results. So uh, as I said, there have been many applications. Uh, there have been applications both in mathematics and in computer science, and I'll, I'll touch on a little bit of uh, both. And uh, following the recent improvements, there were further applications to other questions in mathematics that I will discuss briefly. So uh, the breakthrough occurred in 2019 when Alvarez, Lovett, Wu, and Zhang uh, improved the parameters substantially. And after their work, there were a number of others that uh, made somewhat more minor improvements. There was work by Frankson, Kahn, Narn, and Park, myself, and then Bell, Chula, and Warnke. But the result of all this work is that now we know that uh, uh, as long as you have order p log k to the k sets of size k, then there must be a, a p centaur among those sets. So the improvement here, you know, Erdős and Rada's original bound here looks like p k to the power k, and that's been replaced by something like p log k to the power k. So it is a, a powerful uh, improvement in some settings, and it's enabled new applications that we didn't know about before. Uh, and so one of those applications followed immediately after. It's, it's, an, it's an application to understanding monotone properties of uh, the properties of monotone Boolean functions. And I'll discuss that uh, in a few minutes. So let me start uh, the tour of the ideas here by giving you just a few examples where uh, these results can be used that I think are surprising. Uh, the first is uh, due to Erdős and Sarkozy, who says that you can use the sunflower lemma actually to find other kinds of structures. You can find uh, arithmetic progressions in subsets. So here's the result that they, they proved. They showed that if you have uh, a subset S of the integers 1, 2, 3, up to n, uh, and p is set to the size of S divided by something proportional to log squared n, then you can always find p plus one subsets of S such that the sum of the elements within those sets, the sum of all the elements of S1, then the sum of all the elements of S2 and so on, these numbers form an arithmetic progression. So again, it's, a, it's saying that if you find, if you take an arbitrary set, then that set must contain some kind of structure that's that's unexpected. It's unexpected, which is that uh, you can find a subset of the elements, quite a uh, you can find a collection of subsets of the elements, quite a large collection, uh, with the property that the sums that you get from those sets form an arithmetic progression. And the, the argument is actually uh, really simple once you have the concept of sunflowers and, and know how to apply it. So let me show you how it goes. Uh, so here's the idea. First, you can do a count to show you have you have the set S. Now look at all the subsets of S of size log n. So there are the size of S choose log n such subsets. These are the subsets of S of size log n. And look at all of their sums. And for each set of size log n, its sum must lie, you know, it must be an integer that's either one or two or three up to log n. So the sum of each such set has to be an integer between one and n log n. And so by averaging, there must be at least that many such sets of size log n that all have the same sum, that all have the same sum. So that's the first observation. And the parameters here have been set up so that this number here is, is large. It looks roughly like this. Maybe we won't worry too much about exactly what the parameters exactly say, but there's a large collection of subsets of size log n that have the same sum. And uh, by the sunflower lemma that we, we saw earlier, Erdős and Rado's sunflower lemma, it, this means that this collection of sets must have a p sunflower, must have a p sunflower. And once you have a p sunflower, you get an arithmetic progression. Let me show you why. So let's say you have here, in, on the left-hand side, a three sunflower, three sunflower. 
that gives you an arithmetic progression because this sequence of sums, the sum of the elements here, sum of the elements here, sum of the elements here, is an arithmetic progression. If you think about it, all of the all of the sets here, all of the big sets here have exactly the same sum. So the difference between the subsequent numbers here and here uh, must be exactly the same. So that's the uh, first uh, clever application. So that's, again, uh, something that seems quite combinatorial. Um, <clears throat> I first got interested in this, in this lemma. I studied theoretical computer science. And uh, I first got interested in it because it's played in a, a very impactful role in theoretical computer science. One of the really hard problems in, in theoretical computer science is to understand how to prove lower bounds on the running times of algorithms. Uh, we have ways of designing efficient algorithms and efficient solutions to computational problems. Uh, but we, we can't always tell whether we've hit the end, whether you know, we found the optimal solutions. And the difficulty there is that it's hard to prove that there is no better solution than the one we've already found. And the sunflower lemma has been used a few times to actually prove lower bounds, prove that it's impossible to find a more efficient solution than the one we already know. So I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, the first example I want to show you uh, has to do with the study of data structures. Uh, now, I won't get too rigorous about exactly what a data structure is, but I hope that I'll still convince you uh, uh, about how sunflowers play a great role here. So data structure is a way to maintain uh, data efficiently, okay? So the data structure I'm going to talk about is uh, a data structure for just maintaining a set. So you imagine that you have numbers one, two, three, up to n, and you want to maintain a set. You want to maintain a subset s of those n numbers. And you want to support a few operations. You want to be able to insert an element into S. You want to be able to delete an element from S. And you want to query something about S. Let's say you want to query the minimum element of S. So the, these are the three operations you would like to, to do on the set, and you would like to do it efficiently. Now, what's the measure of efficiency? Uh, imagine that you're you know, you, you have this, you have a, a region of memory and your algorithm can do anything, but we want to make sure that your algorithm makes very few accesses to the memory in order to carry out the operations that, that you're running. Okay. So when you want to delete a number from the set, your algorithm should just go access very few locations in the memory, modify them in some maybe perhaps complicated way, and that, that should achieve the goal of deleting the element. When you want to query the minimum, your algorithm should again go touch a few locations in memory and uh, and recover the minimum of the set. Okay, so there's a there's a huge space of po potential algorithms here. We have some solutions that achieve that achieve some parameters for this problem, but we don't know what the best solution is. And the sunflower lemma can be used. This is a joint work of mine with with a, with a, my former student, Ramurthy. Uh, says that uh, gives a lower bound. It, it says that any data structure that accomplishes this task must access at least log n or log log n locations for one of these operations. There's no data structure that that accesses less, much less than log n over log log n memory locations for all of the operations and successfully carries out these tasks. Okay, it, it doesn't matter what algorithm you use. And, and let me show you, let me show you how you can prove that and how that's related to sunflowers. Well, here's the idea. So let's say you give me some algorithm that is somehow very efficient and is able to carry out these tasks and access memory uh, very efficiently. Then let's define SI to be the set of cells touched uh, by when, when you try to delete the element i and compute the minimum of the set that's being maintained. There's some collection of memory locations that are touched during these operations, and let's call that set si. If all of these sets si are small, then the parameters, the choice of parameters implies that this collection of sets contains a sunflower with p petals. Okay. 
I'm not going to worry about the parameters here too much. I just want to show you the pictures for how the reasoning works. So let's say uh, the sets S1 through SP form a sunflower. So I've now found within the algorithm a set of access configurations that look like a sunflower. Then I can use that sunflower uh, to do something interesting, which is that uh, I can imagine running the data structure algorithm, uh, inserting all the, the elements of one through P one by one, and then deleting the complement of some set T. Okay. So I can do all of these operations with the algorithm. That will change the memory locations. But these P, you know, the, the memory locations accessed here, they form a sunflower, so they look something like this. What you can prove is that after doing these operations, the contents of the core of the sunflower actually encode the value of T. Even though your algorithm touched a lot of memory locations to carry out these operations, the claim is the contents of the core of the sunflower, the middle part of the sunflower here, the common intersection, are enough to recover the value of T. And that proves the lower bound because that says that uh, uh, that, that says that the, the sort of the information stored in the small part must be enough to decode uh, a set, a set, subset of one through P. And when you, when you figure out what that says, uh, it, it proves a lower bound on the, the running time of the data structure. And the, the reason the contents can be used to recover key, uh, T is that you can think about a sequence of operations that decode T that looks like compute the minimum of T, then delete that minimum, then compute the minimum again, then delete that minimum, and so on. And if you reason carefully about what those operations do, you will see that you can simulate all those operations without access to any of the memory cells here, except for the contents of the core. You only need the contents of the core to simulate this sequence of operations. So the configuration of Sunflower somehow allows us to efficiently store a set in a very small number of cells. And uh, if this efficiency is too much, you know, it proves that the algorithm you've um, purportedly designed cannot possibly work. So that's the way you can prove an impossibility result. So it's one application, but uh, sunflowers have actually had several applications in computer science. Um, a very famous application among theoretical computer scientists is a beautiful result of Rasborov proving a monotone circuit lower bound. Um, I'm not going to give the full details of the proof, but I, I want to say a little bit about what it says. Uh, so what, uh, it's been very difficult for us in, in theoretical computer science to prove lower bounds against arbitrary algorithms, prove lower bounds on the running times of arbitrary algorithms. Uh, but what Rasborough managed to show is that if your algorithm is trying to compute a monotone function, and the algorithm does not negate any variables during its execution, then you can prove lower bounds. So specifically, he showed there's a very natural function, which is the clique function. The input to the algorithm is graph. And uh, the algorithm is supposed to detect whether or not the graph contains a large clique. So a large collection of vertices that are all connected to each other. So this is the algorithmic task. And Rosberg showed that uh, if your algorithm does not at any point in its execution negate a variable, then it must take exponential time. It must take an exponentially long uh, time to figure out whether the graph has a clique or not. Uh, and it still remains open to understand whether or not there's an algorithm that solves this problem uh, in a sub-exponential time if it, if it has negations. Okay. We still don't know the answer to that. But again, the proof crucially relies on uh, the sunflower lemma. Uh, he, he manages to take an algorithm that, uh, such an algorithm that accomplishes this task and use the sunflower lemma to actually somehow speed up the execution of the algorithm. This is in a, in a, in a sentence what he accomplishes um, until he, the, the speed up is, is so dramatic that it cannot possibly be, uh, it leads to a contradiction. So uh, he proves that the algorithm cannot exist this, uh, from the start. Okay, so that's another surprising place where the sunflower lemma has been used to prove um, limits on the efficiency of algorithms. So 
some of what I've talked about so far were results that were uh, happened over the last uh, several decades. Um, and now uh, I want to tell you about some very recent results that's been very exciting in this field. That's led both to new results about the basic sunflower lemma as well as new applications. Uh, in 2019, I mentioned already that always Lovet, Wu, and Zhang, and, and with some follow up work, uh, showed improved the parameters. They showed that uh, even if you have just order p log k to the k sets of size k, then that collection of sets must have a sunflower, must have a p sunflower. And uh, this result and the ideas in it were, were then used to, to uh, prove an old conjecture of Talagrand uh, concerning uh, monotone functions. And I'll, I'll actually start with uh, describing this conjecture first. And then once I, once I tell you about the conjecture and reason about it a little bit, we'll be set up well to discuss the, the new result and, and how it works. So uh, let me talk about uh, monotone properties. This is what the conjecture has to do, do, has to do with. And this is work by Khan Kalai, Talagrand, and, and the recent work of Frankston and RNN Park. Franks and Khan and Iron and Park. I left off Khan on the on the title here. Um, so uh, let's say so this is about understanding monotone functions and the structure of monotone functions. So let's say we have a function mapping n bits to one bit, and uh, its monotone means it's monotone monotone if it has a property that whenever x is greater than or equal to y. And here I mean that every coordinate of x is at least as large as every coordinate of y of the coordinate, the corresponding coordinate of y. Then f of x is greater than or equal to f of y. A function satisfying this property is called monotone. Now it's easy to see that um, if you have a monotone function, then there's a collection of min terms. This is the set of uh, strings, let's call it f, with the property that f of f of x equals one exactly when there's a y in the collection of min terms such that x is greater than or equal to y. Okay, f, the, the capital F is the, is the minimum collection of binary strings where f switches, uh, you know, turns on. Then everything above that collection, uh, every, everything above y for y and f uh, is also an input where f evaluates to one. Uh, <clears throat> Now, suppose uh, x1 through xn are independent random variables where each one is one with probability epsilon. Then you can define the threshold of this monotone function, threshold of f. This is the value of epsilon at which the expectation of f of x is equal to one half. So imagine you know, taking this parameter epsilon. If epsilon is zero, then uh, f of x is probably zero. And as you increase epsilon, the expected value of f of x is only going to go up because f is monotone. So as you increase epsilon, the value of the expected value of f of x will just get larger and larger. And at some point, it will be equal to one half. And epsilon is exactly the threshold at which this, this happens. The expected value of f of x is equal to one half. Okay. Uh, and the, the question is, the, the broad question here is to understand, compute, the thresholds of uh, various monotone functions of interest. So for example, uh, a very natural setting is a setting of understanding graph properties. Imagine that you're sampling a completely random graph. So every edge in the graph is included with probability epsilon. You want to know at what point does the graph have some nice structure? Like at what point does it have a perfect matching or a large cycle or, or some other structure? Uh, so in the example where uh, f is the function which, which is one when the graph has a perfect matching, the, the collection of min terms is the collection of graphs that contain exactly one perfect matching and no other edges. This is the collection of min terms. Okay, so you can ask, you know, what, what is the threshold? <clears throat> uh, and uh, actually we, we know what the threshold is for, for this example it's uh, actually uh, log n over n. So when each edge is included with probability roughly log n over n or proportional to log n over n, 
that's when uh, you have a 50% chance of having perfect matching in the graph. So that's the threshold. And here I've just repeated the definitions of the threshold. Uh, there's a very natural way to upper bound the threshold. And that's by just using the union bound, right? Uh, the expected value of F is at most the probability, the sum of the probabilities over all min terms Y of the probability that the uh, X is greater than or equal to Y. Right? So in general, uh, you have a collection of min terms and F is one exactly when the input lies above at least one of these min terms. So you can look, compute the probability that X lies above a min term for each min term. And if you add up these probabilities, you will only be overcounting. Okay, so you get an upper bound on the probability that uh, F is equal to one. So that's why this inequality is true. So you can define the expectation threshold. That's the threshold at which this upper bound here becomes equal to a half. Again, you know, this is a formula which is monotone. As you increase epsilon, the value of the right-hand side here gets larger and larger. At some point, it's equal to a half. At some later point, the left-hand side will be equal to a half. Okay, so uh, the expectation threshold is the point at which the right-hand side is equal to a half. So it's easy to see from what I just discussed that the threshold is at least as large as the expectation threshold. The right-hand side will be a half first. And uh, the conjecture of made by Kahn and Kalai is that actually the threshold is at most order log n times the expectation threshold. That the ratio between these two is at most log n. And in fact, uh, this log n is the correct ratio for the example of perfect matchings that I discussed. So in the example of perfect matchings, the threshold is like log n over n, and the expectation threshold turns out is uh, one over n, roughly one over n. Now I wanna say uh, very recently, just in the last uh, 10 or 15 days, Park and Pham actually proved this threshold, uh, this, this uh, conjecture. So we now know that this conjecture is true and their proof doesn't directly use sunflowers, the new proof, uh, but uh, it actually does use a lot of the ideas that were developed in, in trying to understand the sunflower lemma, okay, which I will discuss near the end of this talk. So that, that's all I'll say about the proof of uh, Park and Femme. Um, it's very new. So I myself haven't completely understood it. But so moving on, so this is the threshold and the expectation threshold, and here's uh, the expectation threshold conjecture of Kana and Kalai, which was recently proved. Uh, but in, in 2019, um, or, uh, sorry, prior to 2019, Talagrand also studied these quantities and he suggested a different way to give an upper bound on the expectation of f of x. It's not quite the union bound and uh, that's given by this. So suppose you find some distribution z on the inputs here on the strings with a property that uh, for every input x, f of x is at most kappa, kappa here is some number, so some fixed number kappa and some distribution on strings z, such that f of x is at most kappa times the expectation over z of the indicator that z is at most x times epsilon to the minus one over, uh, minus uh, the size of z, minus the number of ones in z. <coughs> Uh, the point of choosing this expression is that if you if you have this, then the expectation of f of x can be shown to be at most kappa, because it's at most kappa times expectation over f of x and the expected value of z. But uh, the 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 parameters have been set up here so that this inner thing is exactly equal to um, uh, just one. So, that, so that's, the, that's the point of this upper bound. And this gives an even stronger upper bound than the union bound. So it turns out that this bound is a special case of this upper bound. 
this bound, there is some choice of Z and some choice of kappa that realizes the same upper bound as you have here. Okay, so this bound could potentially be even smaller than this bound. And so uh, you define the fractional expectation threshold, which is again, the minimum value of the, the value of epsilon for which this upper bound here is equal to one half. It's equal to one half. And if you put together all the facts we've discussed so far, uh, the threshold of F must be at least the fractional expectation threshold of F, which must be at least the expectation threshold of F. And Talgrand conjectured that the threshold of F is also within a log n factor of the fractional expectation threshold of F. So the, the very recent work I talked about of uh, Park and Pham actually shows that um, you know, the extreme ends here are close within a factor of log n, and, uh, which was Kahn and Kali's conjecture. And Talgrand made a weaker conjecture, which is just that these two are within a factor of log n. And that's a conjecture that was directly proved as a result of uh, applying the ideas from the sunflower lemma. Uh, and then I, those ideas appear to have been recently used to even prove the stronger conjecture. All right, so let me make one more observation about these quantities, which will give a hint for how the, the actual sunflower lemma was eventually improved. Um, so if you look at this condition here, the fact that f of x is at most kappa times this expectation, then uh, you can use von Neumann's min-max theorem to show that such as z and kappa imply that there's a distribution on the min terms of f. There's a distribution on the min terms of f satisfying the condition that the expectation of f on the min terms, which is by definition one, is at least kappa times uh, this quantity okay. for, every, for every z, for every z. So the way you can prove this, you can think, you can define an appropriate two-player game. That's one way to think about it, two-player zero-sum game, where one player is playing z and the others are playing, the other player is playing u. And uh, that game has a value. And you, you can think of this as uh, the strategy for the Z player. And this is the strategy for the U player. And uh, von Neumann's min-max theorem says uh, a consequence of that theorem is that there is a strategy for the U player achieving this, this bound. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, again, I want to stay at a high level of detail. The consequence of this, if you, if you stare at this expression, is that uh, a strong upper bound here implies that F must be spread out. The set of min terms must be spread out in the sense that uh, for any fixed set Z, think of uh, Z, uh, you know, it, it's a binary string, but you can think of it as an indicator vector for a set. It says for any fixed set Z, there are not too many sets that contain uh, that set. It puts an upper bound on the number of sets containing any fixed set among the min terms. So the, the set of min terms is sort of a, a collection of sets that's spread out. And uh, that's a crucial concept in, in what's going to come. So now, now let me tell you about the ideas uh, explored and studied by the recent work of Alvarez, Lovet, Wu, and Zhang. So, Given a collection of sets S1 through SL, we'll say that they are R spread if for every set Z, the number of sets in this collection containing Z is at most R to the K minus Z. Okay. This, this is what it means to say uh, that you have uh, this collection of sets is R spread. All of these sets here are of size K. So given a collection of sets here of size K, We'll say there are spread if the number of sets containing z for every z is at most r to the k minus the size of z. Now, the key lemma uh, that was basically proved by Alvis Lubit, Wu, and Zhang was that if 
x is uh, epsilon random set, meaning that every element is included with probability epsilon and independently, then if you set r to be something like uh, something proportional to one over epsilon times log k, and the number of sets here is more than r to the k, and the sets are r spread, these sets are r spread, then this random set uh, must contain a set of the family with probability at least one half. Okay. So in a sense, it says, you know, for each, each set here, this is a set of size K. The probability that X contains a set, uh, one of the sets, say S1, is uh, epsilon to the power K. Epsilon to the power K, it's a tiny number. But, if the sets are spread, then with very good probability, X will contain some set of that spread collection of sets. If they are not spread out, then, then it's very easy to see that that's not going to happen. Okay? Because uh, if these sets have a significant overlap, if they're more or less the same, then you would expect that the probability that X contains any one of them to be, to be closer to like epsilon to the K. But if they are spread, this condition holds, the lemma says that X must contain at least one of those sets. So that's the key lemma. And, uh, and a consequence of this lemma is that under the same conditions, so under these conditions, this collection of sets S1 through SL must contain many disjoint sets. It must contain one over two epsilon disjoint sets must contain many disjoint sets. And let me explain why. Imagine, uh, imagine uh, instead of sampling one set X, that's an epsilon random set, imagine randomly partitioning the space, the entire universe into uh, one over epsilon uh, parts. So take the entire universe of elements, partition them into one over epsilon parts, uniformly random. Now, each of those parts, will be more or less like uh, an epsilon random set. So with probability, each of those parts will contain one of these sets with probability half. So if you partition the universe into one over epsilon parts, you will expect uh, one over two epsilon of those parts to contain a set from the family. So there's some fiction, fixing of the partition that will, that will actually find one over two, two epsilon disjoint sets in the family. Okay, so a consequence of this lemma is that if the family of sets is R spread in this sense, then it must contain many disjoint sets. And disjoint sets are, uh, are, are kind of sunflower. Disjoint sets are a sunflower. So that's, that's how this lemma can be used to prove the sunflower lemma. In fact, let me just give you the full proof. So you set the parameters uh, as you need to here, and you say, well, if the, if the sets are spread, then by just what, what I just explained, there must be many disjoint sets. So in this case, you're done, and we found a sunflower. But if they are not spread, then there must be some Z such that many sets, more than R to the K minus Z sets, contain Z. So there are many sets that share a common set Z in the case that they are not spread. But now we can proceed by induction. Uh, take the set Z, add it to the core of the sunflower, and only consider now the sets that contain this set Z. And the parameters, you see that we are set up to now just continue by induction. Now we can analyze the, the, the sets that all contain Z. There's R to the K minus Z of them. And uh, their effective size is k minus the size of z. So we're in the same setup as we started out with. And the same argument can be applied again and again until we find a sunflower. All right. Uh, so this, this, lemma, this lemma is the heart of the matter. It's the hard part. And uh, the lemma also resolves Talagrand's conjecture. It proves that the threshold of F is the most order log n times the fractionalized expectation threshold. 
and and that's because if you if you look at what we said, you know, Talgren sort of observed that that uh, that if the fractional ed, uh, expectation threshold is some number gamma, okay, then the the set of min terms of f is spread. Actually, it's one over two gamma spread in the in the way I define the parameters. That's what the argument we 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 had before says. Okay, so if the fractional expectation threshold is some number gamma, then it must be the case that the set of min terms of the function is spread. And that means that uh, if you set epsilon so that this equality holds, then uh, the, the lemma says that if you sample a random x where you include each element with probability epsilon, the key lemma says that this x will lie above a min term with probability a half. And that's equivalent to saying that the uh, value of the function will be one with probability at least a half. Okay, so that, that proves that the threshold is at most order log n times the fractional threshold. So again, this key lemma is key to understanding both the sunflower lemma and, uh, and uh, making progress in the sunflower lemma and proving Telegram's conjecture about modern twin functions. So all that remains is to explain the proof of the key lemma. So I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to give the full proof. It's uh, too complicated, but I'll give you a toy argument that gives some intuition for a very clever argument to reason about this. So what's the setup here? We have a whole bunch of sets and they're sort of spread out somehow. We want to argue that if you pick a small random set, it's very likely that you'll, you'll uh, pick one of the sets in the collection you include one of the sets in, your, in the collection. Okay, so here's the claim that I will prove. I'm not going to prove the actual lemma, but I'll prove something that, that already should, uh, has a lot of the ideas and um, seems quite powerful. So let's assume that this collection of sets we have are spread in the sense that I talked about. I want to show you that, let's say you pick a unit, just a completely uniformly random set in the universe universe of n elements, then I want to show that uh, even if the family of sets is R spread, where R is some constant, some large constant, then with high probability, there will be some set here that has an unusually large intersection with our random set. Typically, you would expect our random set W to intersect each of these sets in K over two elements. That's the expected size of the intersection. Each of them is of size k. But because they are spread, we'll be able to show that with high probability, there will be an element that intersects a random set in 99% of its elements. <clears throat> so that's the goal. And uh, let's do it. So here's the idea. First, let's uh, consider, Let's we, we want to count the number of sets w that do not satisfy this property. That's basically what we want to do. And we want to show that that number is small. <coughs> so let's say that w is bad if there's if for every set in the family that we're given, its intersection with w is, is smaller than 0.99k. Now we'll count the number of bad pairs w uh, And x, where here w is a bad set, as I defined above, and x is an arbitrary index from 1 through l. Okay. So I'm going to count the number of bad pairs, which, which is basically l times the number of bad w. This is what I'm counting. But I'm going to count them together. I'm going to count the number of pairs together. <clears throat> so here's the idea. Uh, let's count it in this specific way. First, let's count the number of possibilities for W union X sub X, the X set here. This is a set and there's only two to the N sets. So there are two to the N choices for this union. Next, let's uh, do the following. Let's find the first Y in this list such that SY is contained in W union SX. The first Y. OK, 
Okay, there's only one choice for this y. And next, now, so now we know s sub y, and we know the union of w and s sub x. So the next thing we can do is identify the intersection of s x and s y. Okay, now s x intersect s y. That's a set. That's a subset of s y. And there are at most two to the k subsets of s y. So there are two to the k possible intersections uh, here. So now we've we've found you know two to the n choices for this set and two to the k choices for this set. Now because w is bad, if you think about it, w cannot you know overlap s y in uh, you know very large fraction. In particular, you know. 0.01k elements in SY must, must lie outside of W. That has to be the case because W is a bad set according to our definition. And that means the number of choices for SX, you see we've identified these, uh, these elements, which, which all belong to SX intersect SY, that lie outside of W, and they're also contained in SX, and because the set of collection of sets here is spread, the number of potential choices for Sx is only r to the k minus 0.01k. That's from the, from the condition that the sets are spread. Not too many of the sets can contain this intersection, this large intersection. Okay. So there's that many choices for Sx now. And now once we know the, know the, the the uh, value of Sx, uh, we can uh, count the number of choices for the intersection of W and Sx. Again, there are only two to the k choices for this intersection. And after we have all of these variables, you see these variables determine both W and X. Because we have the union of Sx, we have Sx, and we have the intersection of W with Sx. These things determine W and X. Um, so, the result of this is that we get that the number of bad w times l is bounded by all of the choices we made here. Two to the n times two to the k times this number times two to the k. And if you um, if you do this, if you work out what this says, it says that the number of bad w is a small fraction of all uh, all potential w's. So there's just a, a very clever counting argument which uh, is the heart of the matter. And it allows you to use the fact that the sets are spread in order to uh, guarantee that a random set will contain one of the elements from the family of spread sets. OK, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, this argument uh, is bound to have many applications just because sunflowers have so many applications. And uh, one way it can have many applications is by using the sunflower lemma in a black box way. but as the recent work shows, you can also try to use ideas here uh, to reason about, reason about uh, uh, other combinatorial problems. So uh, thank you, and I'll stop here. Great, thank you very much. There are a couple of questions from the audience. I'll read the first one, who uh, David Moulton wrote, sort of seems in these examples that all you really need is some smallish set that contains all pairwise intersections. Is there an extension of the sunflower lemma to deal with that case with a better bound? Uh, yes, there are, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, this is studied by, I'm gonna get the names wrong, Alon and uh, a co-author. Uh, so if if you if you want the weaker condition to, that just the, pair, the pairwise intersections are contained in a small, set, then, um, then you, you do get better bounds, and those bounds actually are tight. Um, however, it's, it's not true that uh, it does work for some of the applications, but not all of the applications. The stronger condition is also useful in, in some applications. The other question was, how constructive the proof of sunflower lemma can be made? Uh, I don't think it's very constructive, <laughs> although I'm, I'm uh, not exactly sure what the word constructive 
me, me it's a different context yes. but I, I don't think it's constructive in any way as far as i know i guess it would mean to find the sunflower in some yeah. reasonably easy algorithmic way yeah there is no there's no algorithm that i know of to find um the sunflower uh uh efficiently you know the the, the part about every spread set containing um, disjoint sets, this is easy because you should just pick a random set and uh, a random partition and hope that you will get, uh, uh, well, no, I guess even that, that, that is tricky. Okay, so I, I haven't thought about it much, but I, I don't think it's maybe not very straightforward to find an algorithm to find the sets. Okay, other questions are welcome. We have a couple more minutes. I wanted to ask back, way back in the talk with the uh, algorithm you presented without negation, whether uh -huh. this is actually a useful notion or whether this is just a kind of toy case in which you can prove a lower bound. Uh, it gave a lot of hope to the project of proving lower bounds. So, you know, uh, initially people thought that um, the reason it was hard to prove lower bounds had to do with all these complicated structures that algorithms can have that we just can't reason about. But somehow this proof, as long as you didn't have negations, was able to avoid all those complexities, right? Um, so I think it, it was most interesting with the, uh, because it gave hope that you would be able to extend those results even to, to, to general algorithms. Um, however, now it's, it's been about 40 years or maybe 30, 30 years and that hasn't panned out. So, um, so I think people are less hopeful. Uh. Any other questions after this beautiful talk? That's a wonderful collection of ideas. 